Um, how many of you are following the uh, Olympiad? If you have been following or you haven't been following, um, you should know that the US team is in first place right now. Um, they, they beat, well, they're playing Poland tomorrow. They beat Azerbaijan today. Um, yeah. And the women's team beat Italy today. And I wasn't planning to show like too many Olympia games, but I found one looking through the games this morning and I found one which would fit in nicely to this, uh, the theme of this lecture. Um, and the theme of the lecture is going to be maximizing your advantage. Essentially, what to do when you get a good position and how to essentially grow your advantage and, uh, and then hopefully convert a winning position. Um, so I want to start with a game played by Tatev Abrahamian, who I'm sure most of you know. Um, she has purple hair. Um, anyone know her favorite animal? Yes. Penguin. Yes. Um, she likes penguins. So yesterday um, I was at the zoo and I have a picture here. I saw the penguins. So I took, a, I took some photos of the penguins. I sent them to her as like good luck. And then she played just an amazing game today and, and beat her opponent like very quickly. So I have to take some credit for her play today. Um, just don't mess up and send her pictures of puffins. Yeah, the puffins are in the same area as the penguins. And it, it's, it's a little bit confusing, but you should tell the difference. Um, but on all seriousness, I mean, she played a really nice game. And she didn't really get an advantage in the opening. But once she got the advantage, she just rolled over her opponent. Um, so I want to go through the game. I won't spend too much time on the opening. Does anyone know the name of this opening after Queen C7? Yeah, teamwork there. Sicilian Taimanath, yeah. Uh, this is one of my favorite openings is black. And there's many ways to play against it as white. I mean, um, any logical looking move here is a line. Bishop e3 is a main line. Uh, Bishop e2 is more classical line. G3 is becoming more popular these days. Uh, Tatev played a, a much more aggressive variation starting with f4. And they followed uh, what is pretty main line theory. Uh, they got a structure where White is usually just developing normally and getting ready for some later kingside attack. Um, and I want to get to, yeah, let's get to this moment where so far Tatev has just played normal moves. Uh, the last move, king h1, very typical Sicilian move. When you advance a pawn to f4, you want your king not to be exposed along this diagonal. Um, and now it's black's move. And I was actually pretty impressed with Black's preparation because Black um, essentially managed to get to a point where it was just about equal. And Black played pretty forcingly here, starting with uh, taking the pawn on e4, uh, knight take e4, more trades on e4, and then Black plays a nice move a5. And a5 has a very specific tactical purpose. Uh, what is Black threatening to do, anyone? Yes. Uh, bishop b4 is one idea. What's the other idea with a5? Yes. Yeah, so essentially trying to make both bishops more uh, active in the position. Um, and bishop a6 is a useful, uh, useful positional idea. I mean, it looks like a skewer at first, um, but if black is able to get this move in, it would force a trade of white's good bishop for black's bad bishop. Um, so from here, rook f3 is played. Tatev is trying to go for some attack. And then after bishop a6, the queen moves, rook d8, and now bishop c3. Um, so from this position, it looks like white is, is really nicely set up to, uh, to further attack on the king side, given the bishops are in great position. Uh, the rook is ready to come over to h3. In some cases, the queen can come to h4. And this is actually a very critical moment uh, for black. And I want to pose a question here. Black to move, what would you play you see this uh, kind of scary attack coming. What should black do to, um, to perhaps neutralize the play? F6. Suggesting F6 will make Ben Feingold very upset. <laughs> it's a move, probably weakening. You said rook, rook F8? Yeah. OK, Ashish? Bishop B4. Bishop B4. Yeah, so black should, in this position, play bishop B4. 
This is, um, I think this is just the most natural move. Basically attempting to force the exchange of the bishops. Because that bishop's too strong. Right? So this bishop is so strong, especially because black's committed to g6. The dark squares are, are pretty weak uh, around the king side. And if black can just trade off the bishops, it should be approximately equal. And it's very common, like in, in this case where black is the one, probably the one needing to defend in the middle game, uh, the more pieces are traded, the easier it is to defend. Um, now what, yeah, question? Mm. Yeah, actually, bishop f6 is interesting, uh, but you are giving away the rook. And I would be concerned as white in this position that the back rank could be vulnerable. Yeah. Oh, you want to take on d8 first. But that trades more down. Um, and black would be happy going into a position like this. Uh, I mean, queens could get traded. Black could even take back and then maybe use a d-file, queen d6. And uh, like can't challenge with rook d3 because it's bishop on e6. So if black played bishop b4, I think it would have been uh, equalizing. It would have been hard for white to push for a win. Um, but all it took was one kind of careless move from black for white to have a, just a massive attack. This position, um, or actually, no, I, I take that back. It took two mistakes from black. One was a kind of slow move, this move rook f8. Well, and then later we'll see the, the blunder. He suggested it, I think. Yeah, you said rook f8. So you're playing like um, the Italian board, was it board three or four, um, who's rated about, I think, 22, 2300. Um, the problem with rook f8, it's a bit slow. And it gave Tatev uh, time here to play a very useful move. So having understood what we just looked at, what should white play in this position? And Tatev did find the right move here. Yeah. A3. Yeah, a3. And I think knowing, like knowing black's idea really helps in finding a3. Even though a3 looks like a slow move, it turned out to be a very useful move in limiting any sort of counterplay and also preventing any trades. I think a lot of you guys would be maybe inclined to, to attack right away with a move like rook h3 um, or maybe bishop e5, but uh, a3 is a, a very nice patient move. And sometimes when you're, you're kind of looking over high level games, you might skip over a move like a3, not realizing the importance. But here it's, it's just so important, especially to restrict this bishop and keep this good bishop on the board. And this is where black, uh, black essentially was careless and blundered. Um, I'll go ahead and say that the best move for black is to still try and initiate some trade. And the best move actually looks really weakening here, but it is, uh, is helping black is to play f5, to chase away this bishop, force uh, the trade of light squared bishops, and then get some position like this where things could trade down even further. Um, and white's still slightly better, but white won't have um, like a, a massively crushing attack. Maybe a move like bishop f8 here to go to g7 and mm, I mean it's pleasant for white but nothing uh, nothing decisive. Uh, what black did instead was played bishop d6 which turned out to have no use in the position it actually turned out to be going for the completely completely wrong idea and this gives white a lot of uh, a lot of time to create initiative. Yeah. Bishop f8 in this position. Mm, yeah, that's probably a better move than, uh, than what happened, as you'll see. The bishop on d6 did not play a defensive role. And this is where black begins getting into trouble. Um, now white to move, what would Tatev play? Yeah? Queen h4. Queen h4. Very simple, very logical. This has multiple mating threats. Um, who can tell me what's one mating threat? Yes. Uh, queen h6, yeah, it would threaten mate on g7, but that allows bishop f8. Queen f6. So queen f6 is one threat, yeah, to threaten mate on h8. Um, also, yeah? Bishop f2 threatens mate on h8. Queen. Bishop f6 followed by queen? Oh, followed by queen h7. Um, yeah, 
like the, the immediate threat is queen h7, yeah. right? Queen h7, king take h7, rook h3. You don't need your bishop on f6 to do that. Um, so maybe this is what black missed, was the fact that queen h4 is just threatening so many things, and black is now in a situation where, I mean, it's necessary to defend against mate. Um, and black went for e5. This is probably the idea with, with starting with bishop d6, but we're going to see this only helps white open the position further. Uh, Tata played a very simple move, rook h3. And then black played f5. So black is trying to extend, expand and, and chase away, in this case, the white bishop. But in extending the pawns like this, it's weakening to the king side. Now white to move. I think there's a few good moves here for white. Anyone want to take any suggestions? Is that a hand? That's a hand. You said take on e5? Bishop take e5. And then let's say bishop take e5. Take on e5. Pawn take e4. Black is up a piece here. And h7 is defended. So um, yeah, if you're going to sacrifice, you want to get, be getting compensation. So after bishop take e5. Oh, pawn take e5 in this position. Ah, pawn take e5. Um, that's very possible. If bishop take. If you're going to play a forcing move like this, you need to calculate. Bishop take f5 here. Aha. Could get a bit murky. Bishop take c3. After f5. In this position. Oh, bishop takes c6 here. Um, yeah, this is a messy line, and not sure if bishop takes c3, rook take e8. Oh, this should be working, yeah. Take, take, and then, I mean, bishop take b2. It's still a bit of a mess. I mean, but white is up to exchange in this position. I want to go back, because Tatev played, I think, just a clearly, uh, maybe a simpler move. Um, the thing to understand here is, OK, the, after f5, the queen defends h7. So, so we want to look for perhaps other ways to advance and, and get to the, the black king. Um, one of the best moves here is to take advantage of the fact that the queen is tied down and just to take on c6. Attacking the rook, keeping initiative, and, uh, and the queen can't recapture because of queen take h7. Um, but Tatev, I think, played an even simpler move and focusing more on the king side. Uh, simply bishop take f5. Yeah, I think I heard bishop take f5. If you, if you saw this, very nice. Because um, now, what happened in the game, black took back. Black doesn't take back. I mean, uh, bishop take g6 is probably a threat. Oops, queen g7. Um, well, white has won a, a very key pawn, and now there's a pin. So I wouldn't be surprised if white could just play a move like bishop e4 here, just have a very strong advantage. Um, but OK, black accepted the sacrifice in the game. And this is where just the compensation is enormous. And, and white is completely winning after rook g3, uh, king f7, and now just pawn take e5. Queen take h7 is probably also winning. Pawn take e5, I mean, is also effective because this h7 pawn can't really be defended. And like, black's position is falling apart. There's a maiden one threat with uh, the queen f6. And sometimes when you have like a strong attack and you're looking for ways to keep the initiative, um, you want to not just consider the checks. I'm sure Tatev was considering moves like queen take h7 and queen h5, which are probably working, but she probably just saw that taking on e5 is stronger. And uh, after rook take e5, bishop take e5, bishop take e5, queen take h7, 
I mean, black, uh, I think black resigned here. Um, the, the queen is either lost or black's getting mated or both. Uh, if king goes to f8, there's rook g8 mate. If king goes to f6, there's rook g6 mate. And if the king goes to the e-file, this bishop would be pinned, and then queen take h7. So for example here, or queen take uh, c7. Um, so all variations, white is just uh, coming out ahead. So this was a relatively quick game. I mean, um, almo almost a miniature. I think a miniature is classified as a game 25 moves or less. This is 26 moves. But uh, it came from an opening where, OK, white was in good shape to attack. Black slipped up uh, a couple of times, first by not playing bishop before immediately, and then not finding this move f5 uh, to try and simplify things. And then white, uh, white was just overpowering. So um, if you guys are not following the Olympiad, I would highly encourage you to do so. Uh, for the people watching on YouTube, if you're watching this, Olympiad's probably done. So you can always go back and see the games. But anyway, let's move on. Um, I want to show um, not necessarily more full games, but rather um, like key moments, key positions. Um, so we're going to move on to this position. And I will guarantee that no one except me in this room has seen this before. Um, this came from one of my students' games. My student was playing black. And upon like looking over this game, I was cringing when I saw black's position around here. Like, like the king's on f8, black's severely underdeveloped. White's pieces are active. White has an amazing center. Um, now my student actually went on to win this game as black which was incredible like given, given this position. My student's rating is about uh, 1900. Was playing a player, I think rated also about 1900. Um, and this is a situation which I think will happen in a lot of like amateur level games where one player will get an advantage and then not know what to do with it. And in this case, white's advantage is only temporary. If you give black a few moves to maybe play like b6, bishop b7, king g8, rook f8, uh, we should count material. If I can count correctly, black is up a pawn. Even though it doesn't feel like it. Um, yeah, that too. Uh, the outside pass pawn can later run down the board. And this is sort of how, uh, how black did end up winning, was white wasn't able to capitalize, and then the a pawn proved to be decisive. Um, so I want you guys to think in this position. I'll give you some time. This is not something I would expect anyone to see right away. But think about what to play for white. Look for maybe some forcing variations and try and be as accurate as possible to grow the advantage. Ken West with the hand raised right away. Yeah. Queen to f4. Queen f4 check. Followed by rook to f3. Queen f4 would play king g8, and you want to play rook f3. And then, OK, you want to mate on f8. So I only see one move for black, queen e8. Not so easy. I mean, you know, you know you're better, but you know, the, the queen and the bishop kind of get stuck. Um, we'll get to that. I just want to make a point. Um, this is what happened in the game. The, the player playing white played queen f4, rook f3. He did. Um, and then uh, it, it didn't work out. Uh, so, it's too just edits. Uh, you're saying d5 at what point? In, after? No. Oh, in this position, d5 right away. Ooh, d5. I can make this on the board. I have to think here. I'm tempted just to just take the pawn. If you're going to play d5, you, you have to have some follow up ahead of time. Queen c5, king g8. Ooh, rook f3. Queen e8. Wow. Looking pretty good. Ooh, but bishop f5, good move. Mm. 
Those are coming very rapidly. What if Rook C8? Um, like Queen A3. Oh, that's also possible. <laughs> Queen take D5 with check. Oh, yeah. But then the bishop is hanging. No, yeah, I want to play queen. You want to play queen a3? Yeah. Wait, one at a time. So you're saying queen a3. Um, this is looking decent. Maybe rook c7. It's getting very messy. It's very possible Like you could be better from this line. It's possible you could lose control because the, the white king is also quite exposed. So I want to go back. I will say there, like d5 is really interesting. It can lead to a lot of possibilities. But there is a more controlled way of playing. And there's a very clear way white can get a, like a clear advantage here. Um, yeah. Interesting. OK, so um, from an intuitive standpoint, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, queen, if you're considering between queen f4 and queen f2, you should be inclined to play queen f2 for two reasons. One reason you, wanna, you want the rook to lead the battery. Um, additionally, you don't want your bishop to be blocked on g5 where it, it can't move, move back. So I want to focus on, on this line because after queen f2, king g8, rook f3 is a nice forcing move. We're forcing queen e8. Also, a quick question, what to play after h6? It's so an alternative uh, defense, but it, uh, it runs into massive problems. Yeah? That looks really strong. Queen f6 is coming. What if, uh, what if queen a4, though? King take g7. King g8. Wait, is there a force made here? So you're saying here, um, if king h7, there's queen f7 and bishop f6 mate. So queen take g6, king e or king to f8. King e7. Queen g7, king e8. Queen f8 here. Has anyone calculated force mate, or you, you're just you guys are just trying to play checks? Queen d6, king e8. I want to go back all the way. Like this, this might be okay, but if you're going to sack your rook, you need to see the final. You need to see the final position. If this is a practical game, um, sometimes you, you, you just want to be as controlled as possible. And like if you have the time, you want to calculate it. If you can find a win in those variations, you can perhaps calculate it out. But um, in this case, before playing rook f7 immediately, there's another move to consider here. Yeah? So bishop takes h6? Yeah, I think bishop take h6 is just the, the simplest approach. If pawn take h6, there's rook f7. If king take h6, there's queen h4 mate. Makes sense? So sometimes there's a, um, there's a common problem among players where you'll see a forcing variation and you'll dig so deep. And then that might cause you to overlook just a simpler move that doesn't require as much calculation. So sometimes you have to focus on like the breadth of moves that you're considering rather than depth. Um, so that was, uh, that was one key variation. So we, we can safely conclude that h6 is, uh, is losing because of this line. Um, so queen e8 is the only move. Now this is a very key position. Because um, like from the start, it's very possible to calculate to this, this exact position. But then the question is what to do next. Um, and this is kind of another exercise in itself. So white to move here, what to do? I think I'll take a different approach this time. Instead of like analyzing one variation and moving on to the next variation, I just want everyone to think and determine what move you would play initially from this position. 
Okay, we have one hand raised. What do you think, Ashish? Which four? Okay. Any other ideas? D5? Okay. Yeah. Rook H3. Okay. So, so far we have Rook H3, Queen H4, and D5. I'll go ahead and say no one has found the strongest move yet. And a position like this, um, I want to perhaps introduce a, a new concept of thinking where um, essentially you want to cycle through different candidate moves. This is called progressive thinking. So it might be easy to get caught up in lines with like d5 or queen h4 and looking for uh, something immediate. Um, but there's a very, uh, very important skill in being able to like continually look for new ideas. So there's a, a different, uh, completely different idea here for white that you guys need to kind of expand your, uh, your, your outlook on the, the position. Yeah. Queen e1 to b4. I like the creativity. It's a possibility. I keep searching. Yeah. Bishop f6 on queen. Bishop f6 with sacrifice. But after after you take back on f6, there's queen f7. But I like the fact you're 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 considering more and more resources. Uh, what's another another resource for white? Okay, queen a2 to a3. It's slow, but it, okay, as long as you're considering more ideas, this is the focus. Yeah, and, and sometimes you can combine these moves. So like queen a2 combined with d5 could be an idea. Still, we have not arrived at the strongest idea here. I want to ask a simple question. Which piece is misplaced in this position? Which piece for white is not doing anything? This bishop on g5. If we can place the bishop anywhere on the board, where would we like to place it? A3. A3. Everyone's saying a3. Yes. Oh, actually so, d6. Or d6. Mainly we want to place it along this diagonal. Yeah. So the, the key move here, like once you ask yourself the right question, the move comes actually very easily. Bishop c1. It's an incredible move. It's like a backwards attacking move. You move backwards, but you reposition on the best square. And the whole idea is that f8 will very soon be in white's control. And bishop a3 is unstoppable. The queen's tied down to defending f8. And black is just too slow here. If bishop d7, bishop a3, and now rook f8 is unstoppable. Um, so it's not, yeah, it's a Karpov move, yeah. It's uh, kind of very patient, but very strong. Um, so I think this goes to show, like even when you have a clear advantage, it can still take a lot of effort and energy to play in the most precise fashion. And here it was, um, I mean, it would have been very impressive if, if the white player found, uh, found this bishop c1 to a3 maneuver. Um, I think the queen f2 move wasn't necessarily so hard, but, uh, but yeah, this would have been pretty spectacular. Um, so. One big takeaway, and this is more of a psychological lesson, but when you get into a winning position or when you, when you know you have a clear advantage, don't get relaxed. If you get too relaxed, that's when you can start misplaying things and play a bit more inaccurately. You really have to like, devote all your energy and focus to finding moves, um, finding moves like this when, when the position calls for it. Any questions? Let's move on. Um, I do have a lot of exercises. We're not going to get through all of them. Um, debating which... Actually, let's... Uh, let me show you guys this game. Um, hopefully all of you have heard of Capablanca. Um, maybe it, it's possible that some of you have seen this game. You've seen this? So this... Um, this position is published in the book Reassess Your Chess by Jeremy Silman, which is a great book, highly recommended for, um, for like intermediate players looking to expand their, their positional knowledge. 
Um, and this is one of my favorite examples of how to uh, convert a space advantage. Uh, actually I actually have the question here, what is white's main advantage? Clearly white has more space, right? But the position is completely locked down. And the question is, okay, white has space, but materials equal. There's not any immediate like clear targets or weaknesses to attack. Um, so the big question is how does white go from having more space to winning the game? And I think this is a really instructive sequence like from this position how to treat a space advantage and how to operate in these circumstances where you, when like if you're playing white you basically have unlimited time to reposition your your pieces do you have a question or a suggestion um so i want to pose a question here uh, and the question i want to pose is what is black's main weakness what is the, the thing in black's position which could lead to the whole downfall. And basically, what, what thing can very easily be attacked, or maybe not easily, but eventually be attacked? Yeah? B7. Yeah, the B7 pawn. Who else wanted to say B7? Something different? Uh, I was going to say that white could like, build, a, build like, a battery on the A file. Maybe the A file. Put yeah. his on E7 and then get his knight on E5. Gotcha. Yeah, so it's kind of, uh, you want to use the A file to potentially attack B7. And I think the best way to kind of show the strategy here is just to play out the moves and, uh, and just admire the way Capablanca executed his opponent in this position. Uh, rook A1, Rook C8. And I think you mentioned Queen C7, but it's, I think, more effective to have a Rook on, on A7. Or sorry, Queen A7. Um, but we want the rook to lead the battery. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's true. Um, so he plays queen b4, enabling rook a7. Now, it's still hard to attack this pawn more times. But, uh, okay, white has time. King f8. Now the other rook comes in. King g8. And we see black is just so cramped. And it's so difficult when you have less space, but you still have a lot of like pieces on the board. Like three major pieces, two minor pieces. This bishop is so sad. The knight is so sad. Um, like the knight's completely restricted. The knight would love to like someday come to e4, but there's no path of getting there. Um, so what we'll see is black was pretty much just obliged to wait until his inevitable doom. So we're going to keep going here. Rook a4, um, which is important move because we want the we want to triple up, but we want the queen to be the last piece in the battery. King f8, black is waiting, queen a3. Um, now it still takes work. Rook a8 doesn't work here because black still has three defenders on a8. So this is where it takes another, uh, another resource to, uh, to apply pressure. Now I like this move, king g3. Um, some of you might be inclined if you had this position to try and maneuver the knight to a5 immediately, which is the key plan. If we play knight d2 here, this is a bit careless because we're missing black's potential counterplay. Yeah? Yeah, knight take g5 is a move we just don't want to deal with. It's very possible this move could end up fine for white, but we don't want to deal with, okay, the sacrifice, the queen comes to h2, and then the whole dynamic of the position changes. So we don't want to give black any chances. That's why Capablanca put the king on g3. And then he put the king on h4. Like the king is safe on h4. Yeah. If the knight yeah, if the knight moves to d2, then g5 is just hanging. It's true. So he puts the king to h4, king h8. And then if I remember correctly, something really funny happened. Was, um, Capablanca just started waiting around, and then he changed his mind. He didn't want his king on h4. He wanted his king on g2. He realized that this is the best square. So he's being very, very patient. Like he's, he's basically wasting so many moves, but it doesn't matter because he has so much time. Like Black can't do anything. And the king on g2, he is probably right that it's, it's safest. Um, it's controlling g3 and h2, so there's no sacrifices where the knight can come to take on g5 and the queen can penetrate. Um, and then from this position, this is where he can begin the knight maneuver. And OK, the knight comes to a5. There's two attackers on b7. Black has one way to defend b7, which is knight d8. 
And now white to move. So white has essentially applied almost maximum pressure, but there's actually uh, there's one more way to increase the pressure. This is kind of like the last straw that breaks the camel's back. White to move in this position, how to increase the pressure even further. Uh, you want to take twice on b7 and then play bishop a6. So mm -hmm. that's possible too. Um, and both of your ideas are, are probably just fine, um, but they're both sacrificing. There's a move Capablanca played which doesn't really sacrifice anything. Yeah? Oh, you know the game. Do you want to say the move? Yeah, bishop a6. Uh, rather than like sacrificing on b7, uh, Okay, this looks like a sacrifice, but this bishop on d7 is undefended. It's so beautiful. White just lined up all the pieces on the a-file. And this whole plan was pretty much unstoppable from the moment white just closed down the position because uh, black had no, no active counterplay. Um, that was great, like Capablanca's technique in the way he was just so patient, making sure there was no, no counter chances. And now there's, uh, there's three attackers on b7 is kind of hard to imagine ahead of time. Um, but yeah, now from here, black falls apart very quickly. He took rook takes d7, rook e7. And now I think there is one more move, and then black resigns. Yeah, nice job. Rook take d8. Because uh, after rook take d8, there's knight takes c6, and just completely win. The family fork. Usually the family fork includes the king, but ah, okay. um, it's most of the family, yeah. And a6 will fall, white will have two connected passers. So I really like this game because it took one advantage, which was space, and it took a while, but eventually white was able to convert it to uh, just a massive material advantage, which um, sometimes in a lot of games you don't see it work out like this, this smoothly in the words of Maurice Ashley, but uh, it works, uh, in this case, it worked out well. Um, so let's move on. Um, so I first came to the St. Louis Chess Club back in 2010. They opened, I believe, in 2008. Eight. Yeah, you know best. Were you here in 2008? Yeah, wow. you played okay. number one the first time. Oh, wow. Yeah, you played Queen H4 surprise. Ah, OK. <laughs> Well, okay, I, I was here, I was invited for the U.S. Junior Championship, which the chess club has hosted for uh, the last, I think in, in 2010, it was their first time hosting it. Um, and then since then, they've had, uh, I think they've had nine, nine junior events here so far. Right. Yeah, yeah. so anyway, um, I, I was playing Sam Shankland. At the time, he was an international master. And actually, before, uh, before the tournament started, he made like a public it was announcement or interview that he was going to quit chess after, uh, after this junior tournament. He was so fed up with like these, uh, these open events where he was trying to get his final grandmaster norm. He wasn't getting it. So he said he's just going to quit chess. And uh, OK, you, you guys know where he is now. So clearly, he didn't quit. Um, but one of the reasons why he didn't end up quitting was because he won this, this junior championship tournament. And that qualified him for, uh, for the U.S. championship the following year. It, qu it qualified him for the World Junior Championship. Um, and one of the reasons why he won this tournament was he beat me. So I might be able to take credit for him, uh, for him continuing chess and eventually becoming U.S. champion. Um, what was interesting also was he lost the first two games of this junior event, and then he came back. He was on a huge winning streak. I was a victim of the, the winning streak. Um, and he played a, played a really nice um, combination against me. Uh, I forget who exactly beat him. It came down to an Armageddon playoff in the end between him and Ray Robson, and he just completely crushed Ray with a Carol Khan as black. Um, it might be online somewhere. You can probably find it. Um, but I want to focus in this moment from our game. Uh, Shankland is playing white. I'm playing black. We have, uh, 
We have a position that came from a Queen's Gambit declined, which is the type of structure that you, very, you see very often in the Queen's Gambit declined. White has a lot of pressure on the C file, has already played A3, B4, and my C pawn is kind of a sad backward pawn. Um, however, I have some counterplay for it. I have the open H file, and I have, uh, I have some nice initiative on the king side too. As we'll see, I play queen h3 here, uh, threatening the, this, uh, this maiden in one. And then he plays knight h4, defending. And now, in this position, I made a mistake. I, I actually made the probably the, the losing mistake of the game. What I should have done was play queen e6. I should have just repeated the position. And then he, he mentioned after the game that if I played queen e6, he was probably going to play knight f3 and be completely OK with a draw. Um, however, I played queen d7 here. Can you play a knight d5 first? Knight g4 would be OK. I, I would probably consider that if, if we went down that line. Um, I want to focus on this position, because this is a very critical moment. And this is essentially the, um, the turning point in the game, where it went from relatively balanced chances to white just having a crushing crushing a advantage attack due to, uh, due to the tactical combinations. Um, so white to move in this position, search for ideas, and try and find the, the best continuation. Is that a hand? Yeah. yeah? Queen g5. Queen g5. What's the idea? Oh, you want to play g4, and then followed by knight f5. Um, it looks interesting. I mean, if you play queen g5, there's knight e4. Queen g5, knight e4. I don't know if you're getting too much. Um, Keep searching for other ideas, yeah. King g2, and then bring the knight to e5. That's possible, but you could walk into queen h3 check at some point. Help you guys out a little bit here. Um, like visually, white is in a nice position. Like there's, there's all this pressure on the c file, and there is some potential weaknesses on the king side that, as black, I have to be very careful about. Um, what Sam managed to do was exploit the queen side and the king side in one like, very nice combination. It all starts with kind of considering the, this key B5. first move. B5. So b5 is a very critical first move. Yeah. One of the most, like forcing one of the most natural position ideas. Um, but what, what happens after b5, so you take b5? Um, play rook c7. We could trade, and then queen e6. You can win the pawn on a7. So I'm going to go ahead and say, he, he does play b5, but for a completely different reason. Um, and I was actually expecting this rook c7 line, so I took on b5. Um, I was expecting rook c7, rook takes c7, and then probably queen e6. And he does win back the pawn, but I thought I would be holding on. Yeah. Um, And then he caught me completely off guard. It was very shocking, because after b5 and c take b5, rook c7 is possible, but there's, uh, there's actually a completely winning move for white in this position. Rook takes c6. <laughs> Doesn't quite work. So you want to trade twice on c8 and play queen g5? Um, not forcing enough. What he does in this position is incredibly forcing. And the whole point of b5 is he's opened up the c file, and now he has a um, very direct forcing continuation. Uh, so before I call on anyone, the question to ask is, what is the most forcing move? More importantly, what is the most forcing line? Yes. 9f5 is by far the most forcing move. Um, and if you play 9f5, you have to calculate. If 9f5, queen take f5? Uh, trade, the trade the queens and win the rook, yeah. So 9f5, what if pawn take f5? Uh, queen g5 check. If I move king f8, you win the rook on c8. Um, 
And let's say knight f5, g take f5, queen g5, king h7. Queen, king g2. Aha, king g2, very nice move. Um, if not everyone followed, I'll draw arrows. So the, the main line is knight f5, g take f5, queen g5, king h7, king g2, brilliant move. To prepare rook h1 with uh, the side file mate. And to my horror, after knight f5, there's no way to, uh, to not get a losing position as black. It was really sad. They're very tricky. And, and even like the smallest differences between moves can have a very big impact on the result. Yeah. So how would have moving your king back to, or queen back to e6 prevented that? So I'm going gonna, uh, gonna to show that right now, because that, that was uh, leading to. Um, if the queen were on e6, Let's actually imagine, I want to play this position out. Uh, knight f5, uh, let's say g take f5, queen g5, and then king g2. So the, whole, so the whole point would be if my queen were on e6, I would have queen e4 check after king g2. My queen would be slightly more centralized. So to go back and actually show this. Uh, one moment. Because uh, let me get it on the board. So queen e6. If white goes for the same idea, b5. Uh, take knight f5. Pawn take f5. Queen g5. King h7. Everything's held together for black. And then king g2. Um, you should realize the answer to your question. f3 uh, does not work because the rook oh. takes e2 check. And there's actually no way for white to effectively get the rook to h1. And probably black is the one who's better here. Yeah. Question? Um, oh, no. OK. One square. So yeah, after the game, when he was interviewed in the broadcast, and then it all made sense of why, OK, queen e6 was so much better than queen d7. But uh, during the game, sometimes it's hard to spot these differences without digging very deep into the calculations. Um, so just to wrap this up, the game ended where I did try and fight on. I took on f5 with the queen, and then I was down the exchange. But then he just started picking up pawns, and then I resigned. So pretty sad finish. Um, then, of course, Shanklin went on to win the tournament. And then, um, then shortly after, he got his GM title. Didn't retire, wrote a book about pawns. And did not retire, yeah. <laughs> wrote a book about pawns, yeah. Uh, it's 829. I think we'll end it here. And then I have so many puzzles prepared that probably next week we'll just do a part two to this lecture. So hope you guys enjoyed that. And now it's time for Thai food. Thanks. Yeah.